By the end of this video, I think you will agree with me that the capital asset pricing model is really easy to understand. Now let's dive into the formula. The capital asset pricing model formula has just four variables and we'll go through all four in order. Starting with the expected return on the security in question denoted as E of R. With the CAPM model, the expected return on a security is what we're actually trying to figure out. It is our end result and we will use the estimate of the expected return to figure out whether we think a stock is either over or undervalued. The next variable in our equation is the risk-free rate denoted as RF. In the field of finance, the risk-free rate is typically based on a government bond yield and the most common example would be a US Treasury and that's what we'll use in this video. Uh, the risk-free rate represents the theoretical rate of return of an investment with zero risk. And it is the baseline for measuring the risk premium, which we will measure later on in this video. At the time I'm recording this video, the return on the 10-year treasury is 4.14%. So in our CAPM model, why don't we uh, pencil in 4.1% for the risk-free rate. Now the next variable that we're going to have to consider is the beta of the security in question. Beta measures a stock's volatility relative to the market. In this example, we'll use the S&P 500 as an example of the market. Now, a beta greater than one would be more volatile than the market, whereas a beta of less than one would be less volatile than the market. In this simulation that I created, we can see how stocks or portfolios with different betas will change in value as the market changes in value. Take special note of the portfolio with a beta of negative one, which actually moves in the opposite direction of the market. Now, in this example, our security in question will be Microsoft, which I can look up and find that it has a beta of 0.89. So if the market goes up about 10%, then Microsoft should go up about 8.9%. Whereas if the market goes down 10%, Microsoft should fall by about 8.9%. Given that the security in question is Microsoft, let's pencil in that beta of 0.89, and then let's jump over to our next variable in the equation, which is going to be our expected return on the market, denoted as RM. The expected return on the market represents the anticipated annual return of the overall stock market. Uh, in the field of investments, it's common to use the S&P 500 index as a proxy for the market. And the historical average return of the S&P 500 for roughly the last 30 years is about 10% annually. Now let's pencil in our expected 10% return on the market. And we have one final variable over here, which we already know as our risk-free rate of 4.1%. And now let's just talk about intuitively what does this formula mean. So we're looking at the expected return on the security of Microsoft. It should be equal to the risk-free rate. So what we could get if we had only invested in a government bond, that would be 4.1%. But to invest in Microsoft, we need to be compensated for taking risk beyond the investment of just a risk-free bond. And what should that compensation be? Well, it will be equal to this total value right here, which is essentially the risk premium in excess of the risk-free rate that I as an investor demand to invest in Microsoft. Now, if we zoom out even closer, and we remove the beta, what is this component of this formula? This is the market risk premium because it is the amount that I demand as an investor to return in excess of this risk-free rate. So if we solve for this whole formula to get to our expected return, we'll find that we're going to get 4.1%, which is the risk-free component plus, and if we do the math here, that ends up being 5.25%. And to invest in Microsoft based on the CAPM, we expect to have a return on this security of 9.35%. Now, based on the expected return on Microsoft of 9.35%, 
How would we determine whether Microsoft is over or undervalued? Well, we can take a look at the security market line to make that determination. So the security market line is on a graph with the expected return as the vertical axis and beta as the horizontal axis. The security market line is this orange line, which intercepts with the expected return vertical axis at the risk-free rate, which in our example is 4.1%. And then as we go to the right, beta increases and increases and increases. And because as beta increases, our uh, systematic risk that we're taking increases, we demand to be compensated with a higher expected return. That is why the security market line has this upward slope. Now, I have plotted two points on the security market line. The red dot is the market portfolio or the S&P 500 index, which we talked about earlier, which has a beta of one. And with a beta of one, the market portfolio has an expected return of 10%, which we talked about earlier as well. Now, the other portfolio is Microsoft. So if we owned 100% Microsoft, then our portfolio has a beta of 0.89 and we expect the return based on the calculations of CAPM to give us a return of 9.35%. But is Microsoft correctly valued? To answer that question, let's assume that we have used a ton of different valuation techniques and we have determined that we actually expect Microsoft to return 11%. So that would really plot in right here because the beta is still 0.89, but our expected return is now 11%. So we are expecting to get more return for the same level of risk, which is good for us if we invest in Microsoft. So in this case, we would say that Microsoft is undervalued. And we can make a unifying theory that any portfolios or securities that plot above the security market line are actually undervalued. Now, on the flip side of that, let's say that we actually figured out after all these various calculations and estimates, we expect Microsoft to only return 6%. Now, while the beta is 0.89, so the risk hasn't changed, our expected return is actually less which means we're getting less return for the same level of risk, which means that Microsoft, in this case, we would assume to be overvalued. And so we can say that for all securities or portfolios below the SML, according to the CAPM, we'd expect that these portfolios are actually overvalued.